If you are a brown bear, you're hungry. Adult brown bears at Brooks River and Katmai National Park eat hundreds of pounds of salmon in a day. This might seem excessive, but it's necessary. They must eat a year's worth of food in fewer than six months to survive winter hibernation. In preparation for hibernation guides much of what bears do in the summer. But not all bears make a living in the same way. Why are there differences in the ways bears look and behave? Thanks for joining us and thanks to you for being here to help ponder that question. Uh, my name is Mike Fitz. I'm the resident naturalist with explore.org and joining me is my co-host Leon Law, a park ranger who works at Katmai National Park in Alaska. Leon, great to speak with you. You as well, Mike. And this is Fat Bear Week in the classroom. Today we're talking about brown bears, how they survive, and answering questions from students across the United States and maybe a few other nations too. Along with answering questions, we're also gonna talk about the different ways that bears look and behave. Teachers, be sure to download the curriculum that accompanies this broadcast at explore.org slash education. Look for the link for the brown bear lesson plan on that page. And I would like to thank everybody who did submit questions. We got about 200 of them. And although we won't have time to answer them all, we'll try to answer as many as we can during the presentation today. In fact, to begin, Leon, let's talk about Fat Bear Week. We've record, we're recording this in the, in the middle of Fat Bear Week and we've got several questions about it. For example, Bristol from Avon Middle School was wondering how do you do or why do you do Fat Bear Week? Um, we absolutely love celebrating all things Fat Bear Week during this time, and it really is a celebration. It's a celebration of success for everything that the bears have achieved over the course of this summer, and it allows us to not only highlight that success and ad adaptability of our bears, but also showcase Katmai's healthy ecosystem overall. And we do this through a March Madness style competition where we pit several bears against each other in different matches. And I think our next question has to do with the contestants themselves. Yeah, I think so. Um, Abby from uh, Glacier Peak High School was wondering how many bears are entered in the Fat Bear Week Challenge. And it's about 12 uh, every year, although this year we uh, added a additional category for uh, for the junior bears. So those are the cubs. Um, and so we had Fat Bear Week, or excuse me, Fat Bear Junior happening a few days before the actual Fat Bear Week tournament began. And the winner of Fat Bear Junior got thrown into the main competition overall. So the main competition includes 12 bears. Uh, however, it's really difficult, Leon, to narrow down the number of bears to include in Fat Bear Week because there's a lot of different bears that visit Brooks River. Uh, so a couple of people actually were wondering how we end up um, picking the, those bears. In fact, Olivia from Father Ryan High School and Mallory from Westside High School are wondering that. How do you pick the bears for Fat Bear Week? So yes, obviously we want to showcase some of our fattest bears. So being fat is part of that criteria, but it isn't everything. Uh, we also have to be sure to see bears at the beginning and the end of the season, which isn't always the case as some bears use the river at different times of the year. So they have to make a photo appearance. And beyond that, we also want to highlight good stories. Each of our bears, they are individuals and the stories that they tell are not just about themselves, but the challenges that different bears face. For instance, we always try to include a cub, a sub-adult, females with cubs, um, males, females without cubs, older bears, and this variety allows us to talk about them as individuals, but also some of the greater and highlight um, those as well too. But Mike, perhaps before we could go, before we go any further, could you tell us a little bit more about Katmai itself and this place that these bears call home? Absolutely. Katmai really isn't anywhere close to any major cities. Um, the largest city that's nearby is actually Anchorage, Alaska. So Katmai is about 300 miles southwest of Anchorage, Alaska. And it, uh, and Brooks River is in the west central portion of Katmai National Park. The river itself is bisected by Brooks Falls. And at Brooks River, the National Park Service and Explore.org partner to host several different webcams. So you can watch the bears that we're talking about live on these cameras. The signal from these webcams gets out of Brooks River wirelessly. It's sent to a couple of radio 
antennas on top of Dumpling Mountain. And then those antennas send the signal to the small town of King Salmon, about 30 miles away. And that's where you are, uh, Leon, in the in King Salmon near the park headquarters. And Katmai is one of the largest national parks in the United States. Uh, but of course, uh, it's also one of the best places in the world to watch brown bears. And in fact, our next question here that we have is from Zach at Meadow, Meadow Hill School. Um, and Zach was wondering, are bears fed or do they hunt for themselves? And maybe as you're answering that question, you can think about uh, answering why do the bears come to Brooks River? Sure. So much of the life of a brown bear is concentrated on the pursuit of food. And here we have high concentrations of salmon, which therefore lead to high concentrations of bears. So, and this is especially true when you think about Brooks Falls in particular, which is in the Brooks Camp area of the park. Uh, the falls itself creates a temporary barrier for salmon swimming upstream. So this makes for relatively easy fishing for bears. And bears are excellent at fishing and catching food for themselves. One of the amazing things about Katmai is that bears here are allowed their wild lives, so we don't feed them or impact their natural lives. So yes, they are very well fed and they do this for themselves. And another question we have from Baylor, uh, when did bears start fishing Brooks River, Mike? That's a good question. Um, probably when you think about the history of bears and salmon, when they've coexisted together, you know, certainly over the last several hundred thousand years in um, different parts of, uh, let's say, Eastern Asia and also Western North America, probably bears have been fishing for salmon at least as long as they've encountered, uh, encountered them. But at Brooks River, it's a little bit different. Uh, we haven't seen large numbers of bears fishing for salmon uh, until the last few decades. Really, it wasn't until the 1970s and the 1980s that large numbers of bears started to fish uh, at Brooks River. So a little bit of a different um, type of situation. We, uh, bears have the instincts, the adaptations, and the hunger and the motivation to catch salmon, but it's not something that we had seen in, um, in a great amount at Brooks River, at least, until uh, the 1970s and the 1980s. That's, a, you know, of course, a little bit of our, uh, some basics uh, about uh, Brooks River, but I, we did get a ton of questions about the, uh, about bears in general, brown bear basics. Um, so I think this is a good opportunity to switch uh, to some of those uh, questions right now. In fact, questions about size, Leon um, Blakely from uh, Virginia Boris Elementary was wondering how much does the average cat my bear weigh before hibernation. So this is peak fat right now. How big are they? Oh, peak fat. So our bears, they are quite large, especially in comparison to bears you might see in Yellowstone or Denali. And so for us, a large adult male can easily be over a thousand pounds. Um, or in the case of perhaps 747, who is our largest bear here in the river, he is estimated to weigh approximately 1400 pounds or so. So these are ginormous beasts. And females, they weigh about a third less. But I know aside from size, which is quite impressive, we do have a couple questions about their lives in general. And I think the first comes from Charlie and do bears live in packs? They don't, it's, it's interesting. You can compare bears to other animals that um, wild animals that many people like to read about or could be familiar with like wolves for instance, or elephants or a uh, pride of, of lions. Bears don't live in, in permanent social groups. So the only sort of like social group that you'll see that lasts longer than, than, a, um, uh, than a few moments or uh, you know a few hours happens to be uh, a bear family, a mother, and her cubs. So they don't live in packs. They are generally solitary animals. And there was a, actually a question related to that that comes from Gabriel at, the, at Meadow Hill Middle School. Uh, Gabriel wondered, what age do female bears leave their cubs to be on their own? So cubs uh, stay with their mothers in Katmai National Park for at least two to three summers. And then at the beginning of their third or fourth summer, that's when the mothers separate from their cubs. And they enter that, that realm of a general, generally a solitary existence. Although we do see bears at Katmai expressing a lot of social behaviors. It seems like to indicate that at least some of them enjoy playing maybe with other bears, but they are solitary creatures overall. 
And one thing that we also know about brown bears at the river is that they are very hungry, Leon. Um, and we did get a bunch of questions about hunger in brown bears and how much they like to eat, things like that. And in fact, that's our first question. Uh, Karima from Reading uh, Senior High asks, how much do the bears eat? Um, that is a kind of tough one to estimate, but we know that bears essentially, as you mentioned earlier, need to eat an entire year's worth of food in six months or less. So it is quite a bit. They won't eat or drink at all during winter time. So they rely solely on their fat reserves. So eating as much as possible is exceptionally important. And I know we have talked a lot about Sam and Mike as being primarily their diet here, but it's not the only things they eat, right? Our next question, I believe, comes from Miguel and Del Sol. What do bears eat besides fish? They eat a lot of stuff. They love fish, and we'll talk a little bit more about that in, in just a moment, but they will eat um, many, many different types of things. If they can stomach it, they're going to eat it. So even in Katmai National Park, if we were to list the amount of uh, different types of foods that bears eat, it would be um, dozens and dozens of species. And in some places of North America, brown bears have been documented to eat over 200 different types of plants. Brown bears are omnivores, uh, so they, that, that means they eat both plants and animals like us. And in Katmai, uh, you know, they eat a wide variety of foods, uh, things like grasses and berries, and, and animals are especially important to them, especially animals like salmon. And that does bring us to our next question. You know, they are omnivores, but Leon, uh, uh, Toriol was wondering why do bears eat fish? So bears like what is plentiful and abundant. And for us here, that means sockeye salmon. And these fish, they are really high in fat. So it allows them to bulk up quickly, which is important over the course of the season. And it is also a little bit about calorie efficiency. So it takes a lot less energy expenditure to get the same amount of calories, for instance, eating salmon than other food sources like grass, especially because fish here are so plentiful. But let's get into a little bit more specific numbers, Mike. And I think our next question has to do with that. Um, so in a month, about how many fish does a bear eat? And this question is from Claire. Yeah, we, you know, we could do a little bit of math here on, on this. Um, let's say a bear is having an average fishing day. Uh, let's say it eats 10 salmon per day. Uh, the average size of the fish that they, that they eat in Brooks River might be around five pounds or so for the sockeye salmon. That's the majority of the salmon that live in Brooks River. So 10 salmon per day times five pounds per salmon. Um, that's it could be 50 pounds per day. And then multiply that by 30 days of time and over the course of a month, I mean, they're eating about 600 pounds a month. Uh, but that brings up the next question here from Bryce at Ludington High School. Uh, Bryce was wondering how many fish do bears eat in a year? And it's maybe a little bit more difficult to, um, to tease out an answer based on that. But there was some studies uh, done recently that can help us to maybe uh, find an answer for that. And also, uh, I would like to mention that Hen Henry asked this question as well, how many pounds of food will a bear eat on average during the heavy feeding period? So these questions are kind of related to one another. And I wanna talk about a study that was done on Kodiak Island several years ago. Uh, the way they, they estimated how many salmon and how many pounds of salmon a bear is eating per year is that they were looking at the bear's fur. Bears shed their fur once per year in early to midsummer. So since the new fur grows back all basically all at once during the bear's active season, it records uh, what the bear was eating during that time. Uh, so it contains you know traces of the molecules that came from its food, just like our hair contains traces of the the, the molecules of the food that we are eating as well. So the researchers first determined um, how much mercury was found in Pacific salmon that spawned on Kodiak Island. And then they analyzed the mercury content found in the bear's fur to estimate uh, the amount of salmon that the bears had, had eaten during the course of the year. And they found that adult males on Kodiak Island ate an incredible 6,000 pounds of salmon per bear per year. And that's just an average. Some of them ate a little bit less. Some of them ate a lot more. Some ate as many as 10,000 pounds 
of salmon per year. So just an incredible amount of food that they, they will eat. Uh, something that I don't think a human uh, could could do and, and replicate. And Leon, that gets to our, our next question here. We're talking about the amount of food that they're eating, but we have we can also talk about the amount of calories that they're eating as well. Aiden was wondering how many calories do bears eat per day? So Mike, if we use your number that they're getting maybe 10 salmon a day, and each of those salmon probably has around 4,500 calories when it is just fresh from the ocean. So you're looking at 45,000 calories easily from 10 salmon. And you know, a lot of bears often see them eating more than that too. So that's just a pretty good estimate. And Mike, that does bring us to our next question. When bears are eating this diet of fish, right? How many pounds does a bear get each day from eating salmon? Asked Keenan. It, that's also another amazing thing about bears is that they can gain weight so quickly. And not only are they eating a lot of, of food, but they're gaining a lot of body mass uh, every day. And in late summer and fall, when they're eating a lot of salmon, and sometimes um, earlier in the summer too, they can gain sometimes between two and four pounds of body mass per day. So an incredible amount of weight that they're gaining, and that allows them to uh, to ex uh, to put on like a, a an additional third of their body weight um, from early summer to late summer, and um, just just kind of amazing. I, I can't imagine being that hungry. They experience hunger on a really a different level um, than than people, and of course there are differences in the ways that bears make a living. You know they're all hungry animals, but they don't all do it in the same way. And uh, we'd like to talk about now uh, the differences in inherited versus acquired traits in bears, uh, because I think this really helps to highlight some of the individual, uh, the individuality of a lot of these bears. Uh, and just to sort of introduce this topic, um, Leon, uh, inherited traits are characteristics passed on from biological parents to their offspring. Uh, but Room 8 from Falls City Elementary actually was wondering, how do you use the traits of different bears to tell them apart? Well, we use a variety of different ways, but if you're talking about inherited traits, let's talk about physical traits first off. So we'll often tell by the fur color, the shape of their faces, the hump of their back. So all of these things look a little different in individual bears, just as they do in people. And so that talks a little bit about how we identify them using those, because we don't have any collars or tags or anything, but merely by their physical traits. And then, of course, we can also talk about inherited behavioral traits, Mike. And let's use hibernation um, to talk a little bit more about that in our next question. Yes. The so, next question why do bears? Very... Oh, sorry. Yep. <laughs> yes. No so, the next question is um, why do bears eat so much from Drew at Co Coyote Ridge School? Yeah, we did get a lot of questions about hibernation. We talked about bears getting fat, but they're doing it because this is a behavioral trait. It's an instinct within them um, that helps them to survive. Um, why do bears, eat? they're eating so much because they are hibernation uh, or hibernators. So they go into the den in the wintertime and they basically kind of like rest during the wintertime. Um, so bears are hiber hibernators. That's the short answer. There's a more complicated answer. And I think as we get to um, the next questions um, in our list here, we'll try, to, um, we'll, we'll try to tease out some of those details on why bears um, hibernate. Uh, Leon, in fact, the next question that we have here is why are bears fat? Camille was wondering that. Yes, so um, we've talked a lot about this, about for bears, fat is essential and fat really equals survival because during this long winter, they don't have any food. So they are relying solely on their fat reserves. And for us, fat bears are healthy bears. And in a related question that we did have, um, how do bears store food, right? And I believe Henry asked that question. And so this goes hand in hand with they are relying on those fat reserves. Not unlike us, they can't go to the pantry or a grocery store when during winter time. So they eat as much as they can in the limited amount of time that they have. And all of that food is stored at fat reserves on their body, which is quite remarkable when you think about it in that way. And then 
kind of moving on, but talking about more of the specifics of Hybrid Mike, our next question comes from Scott Middle School and also from Yorkdale from Sophia as well. A couple questions about this, but when exactly do bears hibernate? In Katmai, they're going to begin hibernating generally in November, but it depends on the bear. Not all bears go into the into hibernation at the same time. For the most part, uh, pregnant females, um, you know, bears that will become um, mothers in the den this winter will go into the dens first. So they'll start hibernating first, and then you have a mix of the other bears le uh, ending usually with the big adult males. So the big adult males usually go into hibernation last, and that may not happen until uh, December, even in some very cold climates like what you have in Alaska. Uh, but after the bears um, leave the river though, you know, maybe they're going to their hibernation site fairly quickly, Leon, um, but uh, Jim and I was wondering, after the bears leave the river, where do they go and, and, and where, do they, where do they hibernate? So bears, they tend to dig their dens on steep, well-vegetated slopes that'll collect a lot of snow because snow is a really good insulator. And it's usually an area less than 3,000 feet. And one of the places that we know that bears den near Brooks River is dumping mountain where this picture was taken and so that they go to these mountainous areas that collect snow and less than 3,000 feet average being around 1,300 feet in elevation at least here in Katmai though it does differ in other places and um, kind of going along with are the hibernation schedules I know you talked a little bit about that but if you can grapevine elementary oh it is Ludington High School, I guess, um, as asking that about their hibernation schedules. Yeah, so we, we may have mixed up some of the names in the schools. That was, uh, that's my fault. So I apologize for that as we were putting things maybe into our spreadsheet here. But yeah, bears are, uh, you know, they have um, different hibernation schedules. So they don't all go into, into the den at the same time. They don't all come out of the den at the same time. Uh, in the springtime, when they're emerging from their dens, usually it's uh, in... Uh, the adult males that come out of the den first. But the last bears that come out of the den, and they might not come out of the den until May or sometimes very early June in some rare instances, those will be mother bears with newborn cubs. So a mother bear going into the den pregnant comes out of the den with newborn cubs. She has the longest hibernation schedule of any, any class of bear and her hibernation period could easily last six months. So imagine going into the den and and, um, and, and basically being in a hole in the ground for six months. That is what brown bears are doing. Uh, but after they come out of hibernation, Leon, um, Emma uh, was wondering how much do bears weigh after they hibernate? Sure, so we estimate that they lose probably about a third of their body weight during this time as they're just relying again on those fat reserves. And that can be even more when you think about sows with cubs as well. So it can be quite a bit of weight that they lose after hibernation. And you can always see the difference, you know, from their spring weight to their fall weight. And that gives you a kind of a good idea of the big change that folks go through. Um, but I think our next kind of question talks about um, why do bears hibernate? From Anthony at Ocean View School. Yeah, they hibernate not necessarily to avoid cold. I mean, they, uh, a lot of bears live in some very cold environments, but uh, polar bears, for instance, they'll stay active all year. Um, so they don't necessarily hibernate like brown and, and black bears. So they're not necessarily doing it to avoid cold. What they're doing is trying to avoid um, starvation and, and avoid famine. There's not enough food available to brown bears in Katmai National Park for them to stay active year round. And that's um, true of much of North America for both brown and, and black bears. So bears are going into the den not to avoid cold weather, but just to try to avoid the season of, uh, or the time of the year when there's just not a lot of food available to them. So they're, they're storing away all that fat as a savings account, and then they burn through that savings account in the wintertime when they don't have food available uh, to them. But one fascinating thing, Leon, about hibernation is how they do it. And we haven't answered that question yet, and that's, I think, a very important question to answer. How do bears hibernate? And that was a, a question that was submitted by a couple of students, um, Conrad and Nick. 
Yeah, so I will, I'll start off by saying in some ways we don't quite fully understand it. Um, but we do know that during hibernation, bears undergo physiological and metabolic changes. So for instance, their body temperature will drop slightly, but we really see drastic decreases in perhaps their heart rate and respiratory rates. And so again, they're not eating or drinking, they're relying solely on their fat reserves. And yet somehow after hibernation, they emerge remarkably healthy. They lose very little muscle mass or bone density city, whereas if a person were to try to do the same thing, it would be a completely different story. So perhaps in the future, unlocking some of these secrets might also be something very medically relevant to us as well. And I know we've talked about hibernation now as how it's instinctual for bear, inherited trait. Um, but in contrast, though, Mike, can you talk a little bit more about acquired traits and how these are different? The inherited traits are sometimes easy to see in bears. I mean, you can see things like different fur color and, and body shapes and, and things like that. But acquired traits are the characteristics that an individual develops during their life. This includes things like physical traits, things that happen uh, to them, such as like getting a scar. Uh, they, it also acquired uh, or includes acquired behavioral traits. And these are things that sometimes bears learn to do, like, like uh, where to fish and how to fish. And all of those things combine to help us identify individuals at Brooks River, individual bears. And, and Leon, we refer to the bears at Brooks River by numbers and some by names. And we got several questions about that. In fact, I think people are probably wondering about a lot of the Fat Bear Week bears. Uh, uh, several students were wondering why do some bears have numbers and some have nicknames? Yes. So bears, they are assigned three digit numbers by our bear biologists, and this helps them monitor and study the bears of Brooks River. So in the past, though, rangers have given nicknames to bears and they have become public. It is no longer our policy, though, to name bears so that we avoid anthropomizing them potentially. So think about questions about does a bear's name change how we perceive them as wild animals? And these are all good things to consider uh, whether or not you agree or disagree. Uh, but it's all, all things to take into account for sure. And let's potentially, how about we use some of our bears from this year, from our Fat Bear Week competition to talk about their different traits as well. And um, let's just go through some of the individual bears we have. And starting with, I guess, 32 Chunk, you wanna talk about Mike? Yeah, Chunk is one of our Fat Bear Week bears. And I think we can uh, take a look at each one of our Fat Bear Week bears um, to talk about maybe an inherited or an acquired trait that, that they have. And Chunk is a really good bear to get to know if you are new to watching bears at Brooks River because he's very identifiable. That wound that he has on his muzzle, um, so right, right above his nose, that is an acquired trait. We don't know how he got that, but most likely he got that in a fight with another bear. We didn't see it happen. He just came back to the river this year sporting that big scar. So Chunk's a really big bear, but he's getting easier to recognize because of that acquired trait, that wound on his muzzle. Uh, Leon, with our, our next Fat Bear Week bear, um, number 128, Grazer, she seems to have a combination of, or a, a characteristic that you could argue is both an inherited and acquired trait. Yes, so 128 Grazer, she is known for being assertive and extremely defensive of her cubs. This year she has two yearlings and we've often witnessed her preemptively confront other bears to protect her cubs. And so, like you mentioned, this is probably both inherited and acquired. She has the natural instincts of a mom to protect her cubs, but at the same time, she has seen this pay off, uh, her assertiveness, and so it does reinforce this behavior. And it has obviously paid off for her as she's been able to secure some of her choice spots uh, for fishing this season. And I know we talked, um, 128 does have cubs this year, and we have other younger bears in the bracket as well. So 131, let's start off with 131, Mike. Yeah, 131 is a younger bear, uh, just a few years old, but living independently, so separated from uh, her mother uh, a couple of years ago. And one of the things that you can see in her that is an inherited trait is just her fur color. Like in people, um, the fur color of brown bears seems to be inherited. 
Uh, and we don't know necessarily if 131 got this uh, fur color from her mother. Certainly could have been because her mother has fairly blonde fur, but it also could have been, you know, maybe a trait that was in her dad's genes as well. But um, yeah, that's a, certainly an inherited trait that you can see in bears. That is uh, fur color, claw color, and even ear color. So the, um, so it's not only, um, you know, maybe how big they're able to grow. Uh, that That's certainly, in a, um, you know, perhaps an inherited trait, but also fur color. And we can see that maybe in, in cubs as well. Uh, the, in fact, our next, uh, you know, uh, competitor, so to speak, in Fat Bear Week was 132's cub. Uh, and David uh, from Ludington High School was wondering how much do cubs usually weigh when they are born? Yes, so 132 spring cub won the spot in the bracket this year by competing in our first ever Fat Bear Junior. So 132 spring cub is our Fat Bear Junior champion. Um, and let's see, for, for weight, when they are born inside the den during winter and they weigh approximately a pound, so about the size and weight of a soup can, so pretty small overall. And I know when also we're talking about young bears and you can see in this picture, they have pretty dark fur. So we have another question from Zayden, why are baby bears dark? But it seems like when they grow up, they take on a different color. I don't think we know. Um, it when 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 yeah when we see the, uh, a lot of the the baby uh, cubs arrive at Brooks River they're small and they're almost always darkly darkly colored um, with their fur, but um, towards the end of the summer they many of them will um, become a lighter shade of brown for instance and especially when they are two or three years old or sometimes older they can be much lighter in color sometimes very blonde, so we don't know why they're they're born so dark um, and then their fur color changes. I, I wonder if uh, it has something to do with, um, you know, helping to camouflage them when they're really young. Uh, maybe it's just harder for them to be spotted um, by uh, another bear or a predator on the landscape. Um, you know, if they're walking through a forest and they happen to be dark, I don't know. Or maybe if they're darkly furred, it just helps them to stay warmer in the springtime uh, sunshine. But it does change over time. That's a question that we don't answer. So maybe if uh, you know Zayden wants to study that further, he could come up um, with uh, an answer and share that with us because I think we would we would love to know. Uh, and of course, the cubs are really small, Leon. Um, you know, compared to their mothers. Uh, but Kimberly uh, was wondering how do the cubs hibernate if they don't have as much fat as their mom. So let's start by talking about spring cubs in particular. So spring cubs will suckle in the den on mom's milk, but they are. this is the only time that they will do that. In subsequent years, they hibernate just like adults. And even though they might not be as large as mom in size, they probably have proportionally similar percentage of fat. So they too, just like adults, will rely on their fat reserves. And they do this quite well. And I think let's talk about one of our next competitors too and some of those traits. I think it's 151 Walker we have coming up. Yeah, Walker's a great bear to watch. He is uh, shaped like a light bulb at this time of the year. So really fat. And I think he has an inherited trait in him that we can see if we look at pictures of him and compare that with pictures of his mother. So we talked about fur color and how that's an inherited trait, but sometimes I think facial features can be an inherited trait in bears too. So let's take a, a picture, a look at Walker here in 2014. So this is a few years ago. He was much younger than he is right now. Uh, but now take a, a take a close look at his face and now take a, a, a look here at his mother. This is number 818 in 2006. So sometimes those physical inherited traits can be difficult to see in brown bears, but if you take a closer look and you follow different bears through different generations, we might be able to see some of those inherited traits passed on from mother to cub. And I think Walker's a great example of that. So um, you, we've, we've talked a bunch about inherited traits, um, a little bit about uh, acquired traits though. And I think that our next bear, Leon, is a good opportunity to, to talk about acquired traits in brown bears, number 402, because she's a, a very skilled angler. 
Yes, 402, she is very skilled, especially at fishing the lip of Brook Falls, of Brooks Falls. And uh, when you think about fishing the lip, it actually requires a good amount of skill. It isn't something that comes naturally to bears. They learn this over the course of their lives, either through gaining fishing experience there with mom, watching other bears, or practicing for themselves. It's not something that all bears are able to successfully do is fish, fish this location. So imagine you are standing at the top of a waterfall and a five pound bag of flour, I think is the analogy you like to use, is being thrown at you and you have to catch that in your mouth. And so imagine doing that as a bear. And so it's definitely something that you have to have a lot of skill and practice over time to be successful in doing that. And um, let's move a little from 402 to another female as well and talking about some traits and I think in fur color with 435, Holly. Yeah, Holly is another one of our very recognizable bears at Brooks River. Uh, she gets quite fat at this time of the year. She's a beautiful bear. She has fairly blonde fur throughout the year. Uh, and that, as we mentioned before, is an inherited trait. So I suspect that Holly uh, got that trait from her mother and her father, but she's also um, she's also passed that trait on to her offspring. She's had several cubs, and many of those cubs come back to Brooks River. Um, and this year, she has a yearling cub, and you can see how blonde her yearling cub is. So I think that's also an inherited trait that she's passing on to her offspring. And maybe if that that yearling comes back next year as an independent bear or in the future and raises its own cubs, it will have the opportunity to pass on Holly's blonde fur to her. Uh, own offspring. The next bear that we'll talk about here um, are another Fat Bear Week competitors, 480 Otis. And he's a kind of a blonde bear for an adult male, but he has acquired traits um, that are maybe a little bit different than a lot of our other bears, Leon. Yes, yeah, so 480 Otis, he is one of our older bears on the river. And because of his age, he isn't able to displace bears from his preferred fishing spots, but he is still very successful. And he shows this in his patience as he waits to take advantage of opportunity when bears leave those areas that he wants to fish. So he demonstrates patience here, but also in overall fishing. He often waits and lets the fish come to him rather than chasing the fish around. And so this has proved a successful trait, a successful strategy that he has learned over the course of his life. And let's talk about maybe another up and coming male, um, 503. Yeah, he is a young adult male who's growing really fast. He could become a very dominant bear in the future. He has an inherited trait um, his his ear shape, I think that closely resembles his mother's. If you look at kind of how his ears uh, sort of like curve upwards um, on the backside, almost like a comma or an apostrophe. Um, his biological mother is number 402 and her ears are kind of shaped like that as well. So this is, I think, another example of an inherited trait getting passed on from mother to offspring. So, and we see changes in body size, uh, you know, overall can be an acquired trait, um, Leon, you know, so they have the, like these distinctive physical traits like facial features and ears, but, you know, they're inheriting the ability to get fat. That's, um, uh, you know, also an, an inherited trait. Um, it, it's an acquired trait um, in, in some ways uh, as, as well. Uh, but the ability to change body size um, is, that's something that is inherited by all brown bears. And I think Popeye is a good example of that. Yes, Popeye definitely is. He's a great example and just seeing that overall weight change. And we've talked a lot about how bears get fat to survive and it's definitely, you can see that here and just getting fat alone. I'd also like to point out that he is just a great example in general of an archetypal brown bear. He has grizzled fur, he's got a prominent shoulder hump, he's got a round face. So overall, he is a great example to point out in those traits, but also in overall this change in body size. And I think talking about that change, it also brings us to perhaps one of your favorite bears, 747, who is also known as being the largest bear here on the river. And somebody did ask, actually Jordan um, asked, what is the weight of the largest bear in Katmai, and we don't know for sure, but if I were to place a bet, uh, I think my money would be on 747 because he is a real giant of a bear. He probably weighs about 1400 pounds 
at this time of the year. And that makes him one of the largest brown bears on earth. Like the maximum body size of brown bears, either on Kodiak Island or the Alaska Peninsula, where Katmai National Park is, is really up in that like 1,400, 1,500 pound range. So, so 747 is a really big bear overall. So he not only um, acquired the fishing skills to get fat, but he also inherited the right combination of genes that allowed him to grow so large. And I think he's a really good example of just how big bears can get. We're not really going to show or, or see many bears as large as him. So he is a great bear um, when you want to consider how just how big they can actually get. And our last fat bear week bear, Leon, shows a, a curious habit that we're not sure if it's an inherited or an acquired trait. Yes, and we are talking about 812 here. He is a younger bear, so he's around six years old, and we have often seen him licking his lips, and we don't know really why he does this. So is it an inherited trait or an acquired trait? Simply put, we just don't know. And that kind of brings us back to, there are so many things that we are still learning about these bears, and he is just a great example of this. And I think overall, you know, we've talked about the competitors of Fat Bear Week, we've talked about Fat Bear Week um, in general, and framing it through this traits aspect as well, so using the Explore curriculum. But there are lots of ways to also bring Fat Bear Week and Explore.org live cams into the classroom. And so aside from this great live chat, which we hope to do every year at as well, and using that Explore curriculum. Um, the park also has a extension ideas that you can find on, web, on the web um, at go.nps.gov slash fbwclass. And it has activities for all grade levels and subjects to really keep learning about these bears. And that is what we want people to do and encourage people to bring this into the classroom as well. Yeah, I encourage everyone to, to take a look at those and download those if you are a teacher. Uh, we do have a few additional, actually th just three more questions that we're going to try to answer here before we sign off, Leon. These are um, questions that I thought maybe didn't fit um, into our, our, our main section of the program, but were great questions uh, to answer nevertheless. And I thank everyone who submitted your questions in advance. I did read every one of them, so thank you for those. Uh, but uh, Anya, was wondering, do the bears ever get hurt, like breaking a bone? And what do they do when they get hurt? So bears are really quite resilient. And in ways that we, again, going back to things we have yet to learn about them, we don't quite understand. And they often um, have injuries that perhaps for people would require some kind of intervention. And yet they come back after different seasons and you can't even see the results of those. So Mike, do you yeah, have anything to add to that? Yeah, they are extremely tough animals. When we look at, um, at bears, sometimes we'll see them chewing fish with broken jaws. I mean, just really, really tough animals. So they do get hurt um, sometimes quite severely, but they just power through it. Um, really an amazing thing uh, to see in a wild animal. Leon, I think this next question is, um, is a great one for you to answer. Aiden was wondering about being a park ranger. Uh, specifically, Aiden asks, how do you become a park ranger? First off, I would say that it is important to pick something you love because there are so many different types of park rangers and there's something for your interest, whether you're interested in natural resources or cultural resources or law enforcement or administration, there are many different types of park rangers. And so I know for a lot of people, start by looking for volunteer experiences or internships. Um, I know that I got started through the Student Conservation Association, but there are many different ways and start by even connecting with parks locally too to get some of that experience. And I, I would add, try to be as curious as you can about um, the, the world around you. Um, park rangers are in, by nature, I think, very, very curious people. So it really helps to start to pay attention to the plants and the animals, the geology and the history of your area that can really help uh, in your park service career going uh, or your park ranger career going forward. And the last question that we have comes from uh, Lucy, and Lucy wonders, why do you love bears so much? 
I think there are so many different reasons to love bears. And you can start off with thinking about the bears here in Katmai that you're able to see. And we are able to witness things that in nature, it's harder to see those things. So the more that you learn and understand something, the more that you'll find that you come to love them as well. And so they're such enigmatic characters. They are individuals, but then they are also a remarkable species. So that's why I love bears. Mike, what about you? Well, I love bears for a lot of the same reasons. They are, uh, they're very different, each one of them. They're very individual animals. Um, they're very intelligent animals. They teach us new things all the time. And there's so many things that we don't know about them. So I enjoy the ability to maybe um, watch them closely and learn more about their lives. So they're very fun animals to watch. Um, and I encourage everyone to check out their, our webcams and, um, and, and try to visit Katmai in the future and see these bears in person if you have that opportunity. Leon, it's been um, great to talk with you today. Um, um, I enjoyed uh, the conversation and I hope our students at home uh, uh, found, found this as informative as I did. So thanks so much. Thank you, Mike. And before I sign off, I'd just like to say that brown bears at Brooks River show us that there's more than one way to make a living. And while many physical traits are inherited, a bear's acquired traits are important are an important component of their survival. So each bear you see at Brooks River is a unique individual. And a bear's combination of acquired and inherited traits provides it with the tools and skills necessary to survive in what is a tough and competitive environment. My co-host today for Fat Bear Week in the Classroom was Leon Law. She's a park ranger at Katmai National Park in Alaska. And my name is Mike Fitz. Thanks for joining us today. Happy Fat Bear Week, everyone, and have a great day.